Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the health and disability session of the 2023 virtual SIP conference. Uh, my name is Natalie Young. I am a sociologist in the health and disability statistics branch here at the US Census Bureau, and I'll be serving as chair of today's session. We'll be hearing from two presenters today. The first will uh, will be a presenter who is going to talk about the topic of SSI student earned income exclusion. The paper's author, Shoher Ohanison, is a PhD candidate in economics at the University of Illinois at Chicago. We'll then hear a paper on the topic of income volatility and health. The presenter for that paper, Julie Tsai, is an economist at the Center for Economic and Policy Research. In addition to our two paper pre presentations today, we are lucky to have subject matter experts from both the US Census Bureau and the Centers for Disease Control serving as discussants for our session. Adam B. will serve as a discussant for the first paper on SSI student earned income exclusion. Dr. B. is an economist in the income statistics branch in the, uh, at the US Census Bureau. And then we also have La Larissa Makita, who will discuss the second paper on income volatility and health. Dr. Makita is a demographer at the Centers for Disease Control. She is also former chief of the health and disability statistics branch at the Census Bureau. So I do want to mention that the first part of this session will be the presentation of the two papers. Since this is a smaller panel, uh, the panelists do have the presenters, the paper presenters will have uh, 20 to 30 minutes to present their research. They may take less time or more time, uh, but we'll still have plenty of time for discussion and Q&A at the end. Following the two presentations, we'll hear from each of the discussants and their remar remarks will be followed by an open Q&A session in which audience members are invited to ask questions. I do ask that all members of the audience please hold any questions that you have for the presenters until the Q&A. You can go ahead and drop them into the chat box, but in terms of verbally asking questions, I ask that you wait until the end in the Q&A so that we don't have disruptions during the, uh, the talks that are given today. And I did want to mention that during the Q&A session, there will be a way to, uh, to raise your hand. And if you wanna ask a question, you should click the raise hand icon. I will call on you, you'll be unmuted and you'll have the opportunity to speak. And we can go over that again as we get closer to the discussion session. All right, uh, now that we are a few minutes in, let's go ahead and get started. Let's begin by giving a warm welcome to Shoher, who will be presenting her paper entitled The Effect of the SSI Student Earned Income Exclusion on Education and Labor Supply. Thank you, Shoher. We're excited to hear this project. Thank you so much, Natalie. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here. So my name is Shoher. I'm a PhD candidate in economics at the University of Illinois at Chicago. I'm on the job market this year. I'm an applied microeconomist and I specialize in public economics. And my research in general aims to understand the provision and effects of social safety net programs in the US that are intended to help low income families and improve their economic opportunity and mobility. The debate over the expansion of those public assistance programs during the COVID-19 pandemic that reflects this long-standing controversy over the cost and benefits of public assistance programs of, or means-tested programs. On the benefit side, it's good that cash or in-kind support is being transferred to individuals who are facing major economic hardships, such as unemployment or disability. But on the cost side, when the eligibility for those benefits and the benefits are being linked to total income and more specifically to earned income, that could create distortions in those um, individuals' decisions in labor supply or investment in, in their human capital investment. Uh, in their human capital skills. And what I do in my job market paper is that I study this issue in the supplemental security income setting or the SSI. And in particular, I'm looking at the effect of the SSI student earned income exclusion on education and labor supply. So I realize there are many policy terms in my title. So I will start by defining what SSI is. SSI or Supplemental Security Income is a large public assistance program in the US. 
it provides about $800 per month to low income individuals who have disabilities. It's a means tested program, which means that it's, uh, eligibility for the benefits and the benefits are linked to earned income. And uh, so an SSI recipient who enters the labor market and earns income, their SSI benefits decrease by 50 cents for every additional earned income. So the marginal tax rate on their earnings is very high at 50% level. And in my job market paper, I'm focusing on young SSI recipients because early adulthood is a very critical stage of human capital formation. And more specifically, those young SSI beneficiaries between the ages of 19 and 22, they have much poorer educational and labor market outcomes relative to other young individuals who are in the same age range, who live in low income households, but do not receive any SSI benefits. They are 50% less likely to enroll in post-secondary education or work. And because this early adulthood is a very important stage of development in the life cycle, and if those young SSI recipients are not investing enough in their human capital skills or labor skills, it's likely that their skills are going to depreciate over time. They're going to stay on those public assistance programs in their adulthood in the long run, and it's, um, uh, there's, uh, it's going to be harder and harder for them to enter the labor market or to smoothly transition into adulthood. But uh, uh, next slide, please. But most of the SSI literature has focused on uh, child SSI beneficiaries who are below age 18. And that makes sense because as this graph is showing, there was a big expansion in child SSI caseloads since the early 1990s and even in the last two decades. Next, please. But there is very little work on young SSI recipients who just transitioned into adulthood. So I'm talking about SSI recipients between the ages of 18 and 21. And if we look at their caseloads, their caseloads also increased during the same time period. Next. And if uh, we look at the caseloads of SSI recipients who are just a, a bit older, so those who are between the ages of 22 and 29, their caseloads started increasing in mid 2000s. So basically, it remains an open policy question whether the increase in SSI caseloads is going to trickle down into older age groups in the future. So the main idea of this. Uh, 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 of the slide is that if they do remain on those SSI disability roles in the long term, that could translate into substantial welfare spending over time. So it means that those young SSI recipients are an important target group for uh, human capital or uh, employment in interventions. Next. So what I do in my job market paper is that I study the student earned income exclusion or the SEIE, which is the only education and work incentive for those young SSI recipients who are below age 22. And specifically, I'm studying the effect of this SSI student earned income exclusion on the educational and labor supply outcomes of those young SSI recipients. Next. So now that the policy concern is clear is that those young SSI recipients, they can stay on those SSI disability roads in the long term uh, and uh, that could translate into substantial welfare spending. The question is, how can policymakers help those young SSI recipients to uh, incentivize, uh, help them in, um, uh, invest in their skills? And uh, that could help them at some point transition smoothly into adulthood and uh, uh, realize economic uh, self independence, uh, ec economic independence. But that 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 uh, solution is a bit challenging in the SSI setting because the SSI is a means tested program. So here I'm showing that. Uh, on this graph, on the way uh, on the y axis, the amount of SSI benefits, and on the x axis, the earned income. 
So if an SSI recipient is not earning any income, their SSI benefits is at, at the maximum level, $800 per month. But as they join the labor market and they start earning income, their SSI benefits decrease by 50 cents for every additional earned income until the SSI benefits are completely phased out. So what's happening here? So the marginal tax rate on their earnings is very high, 50% level. And that could explain their low levels of participation in the labor market. So this is regarding their labor supply outcomes. What about their education? First of all, education is a risky investment for any individual, right? Because it takes time and effort, it's costly, and the returns are pretty variable. It's uh, true that uh, the majority of people with a post-secondary degree, they end up getting uh, 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 well-paid jobs. But it's also true that many people with post-secondary degrees, they end up in low-paid jobs. Basically, those are jobs that they could have gotten without a post-secondary degree. So education is a bet that pays up for the majority of people, but it's especially risky for those youngest SER recipients because they can rationally choose to stay out of the labor market they can rationally choose to get $800 per month without working until a high weight job is reached to offset the risk of giving up the, their SSI benefits. On top of that, education is costly. So, of course, tuition waivers or financial aid might exist to cover the direct cost of education. But if they want to cover their indirect cost of education, whether that's commute or books and supplies or rooms and board, what a low income individual would do is that they would get a job. But that's of minimal value for those young SSI recipients because of this, again, the high marginal tax rate on their earnings. So the idea is that we want young SSI recipients who want to go to school, be able to do that without thinking where they're gonna sleep every night or without experiencing hunger. So what policymakers have been trying to do and what the Social Security Administration they try to do is that they've been trying to make education easier for them and they've been trying to incentivize education. Next, please. So they implemented this policy, the student earned income exclusion, which is the only education and work incentive for young SSA recipients who are below age 22. And what SEIE does that it removes the work disincentives that are embedded in the SSI program. So what SEIE does that it exempts about $2,000 of monthly earnings from your SSI benefit calculation if you are below age 22 and you are attending school. So as this blue line is showing that if the SSA recipient satisfies these two conditions, they can uh, keep the maximum level of their SSI benefits, $800 per month, while earning up to $2,000 per month. If they ever earn uh, um, above $2,000, it's the same schedule between their SSI benefits and earned income where the marginal tax rate is 50%. So what's this SEIE do, uh, uh, trying to do? So it's mainly doing two things. First of all, it's giving those young SSI recipients the option of labor market. Now that the cost and the risk of entering the labor market are lower, more SSI recipients would uh, participate in the labor market would test up their labor skills and learn about their preferences for job. So some SSI recipients who might have otherwise not entered the, the labor market, now they can realize substantial gains from uh, networking or uh, building work experience and work history. So this is the first thing that SEIE is doing. What about their education? So SEIE is acting like a school subsidy because the increase in their potential earnings or in their potential total income is conditional on them being enrolled in school. So it's, it's acting like a school subsidy and it's removing those financial constraints and liquidity constraints that those young SSI recipients face during post-secondary education. So that's why in my job market paper, I'm trying to look at the effect of this um, uh, uh, SEIE on the education and labor market outcomes of those young SSA recipients. So again, without SEIE, you're getting $800 per month. With SEIE, 
it's eight hundred dollars plus two thousand dollars, so which means twenty eight hundred dollars per month. So we're moving from a case to a case where your standards of living are being tripled, and it hasn't been studied this in the literature, and this is why we have to look at it because if it has any positive effects, it can turn out to be very important in this big shift of those young SSI recipients transitioning into adulthood. Next, please. So how do I look at the effect of this SEIE on, uh, on the outcomes of uh, young SI uh, beneficiaries? I'm using data from the Survey of Income and Program Participation, or SIP, which is a large nationally representative sample of uh, US households. It focuses on uh, low income households and collects rich information about them, such as their participation in public assistance programs, and, uh, uh, and one of those uh, programs is the SSI or Supplementary Security Income. And what's cool about SIP is that I'm able to distinguish the exact household member who's receiving those SSI benefits, which is quite different from other surveys where the SSI benefit is only defined at the household level and not at the individual level. On top of that, uh, SIP provides very detailed information about individuals' age. So I get to see their birth year, but also their birth month, which is very crucial to my identification strategy, as I will explain in the coming slides. Uh, but uh, uh, and, um, I mean, SIP also provides the outcomes that, are, that I am interested in, the education and labor force variables. And in addition to that, I have their demographic characteristics and state of residence. So I'll explain my methodology in, on, on, in the next slide. Um, be, so, so yeah, sorry, before I uh, uh, talk about my uh, methodology, I just want to mention that my main sample is individuals who are getting positive um, um, uh, 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 SSI, positive number of SSI benefits and who are around age 22. So 12 months below age 22 and 12 months above uh, age 22. And in the first section of my paper, I'm limiting my sample between 2001 and 2004, because after 2004, uh, there was a change in their SSI uh, benefit calculation. So I don't want to get into that just to keep everything as clean as possible. But before 2001, the financial incentives were much lower because the amount of the uh, monthly earning exemptions, as I mentioned, it was $2,000, but before 2001, it used to be only uh, uh, $400. So my main uh, sample is between 2001 and 2004. If I have time, I will go and explain what happens before 2001 as well. Yeah. So here I'm just showing a summary stat uh, a table where in the first column I have those young SSI recipients who are around age 22. In the second column, I have young individuals who are in the same age range but who are not receiving uh, any SSI benefits, but they do live in uh, uh, low income households. And my main outcomes are school enrollment, participation in the labor market, or uh, 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 more specifically employment rate, and this joint outcome that the policy that the student earned income exclusion it's targeting because it's incentivizing them both to be employed and also enroll in, uh, enroll in school. So I'm looking at this uh, uh, joint outcome. I also look at the intensive margin of their labor supply, monthly earnings and uh, weekly hours, and I also have access to their covariates. But the point that I want to make here is that the levels or the rates of uh, participation in post-secondary education or uh, the labor market, they are much lower, as I mentioned in the beginning of my presentation, uh, relative to uh, young individuals who are not getting any SSI benefits. I just want to make, so this is the main point of uh, the slide that I wanted to make, but I just want to make clear that I'm not using the non-SSI recipients or the non-SSI individuals as my control group because those individuals are fundamentally different from my SSI beneficiaries who have uh, uh, disabilities. Next, please. So this, the table was just a snapshot. So if we want to look what happens to their school enrollment or to their outcomes around this strict SEIE age eligibility cutoff at age 22, 
I'm showing this graph uh, 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 to see that. So on this graph, on the x-axis, I have the age of SSI recipients in month, and everything is centered around age 22, which is the cutoff for the eligibility for uh, SEIE. So zero indicates when those young SSI recipients turn 22 years of age. The negative values when uh, indicate when they are younger than uh, 22, and the positive values when they are older than 22. And on the y-axis, I have their school enrollment. So as you can see, there is a decreasing rate in their school enrollment, and that makes sense because they are getting older. But once they cross this age 22 cutoff, where they lose the eligibility for this work and education incentive, their uh, school enrollment decreases by about 8.6 percentage points. So again, just to uh, 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 reiterate, the idea is that when they are below age 22 and they are enrolled in school, they become eligible for the uh, uh, SEIE. When they are above age 22, whatever their school enrollment rate, uh, whatever their school en uh, enrollment status is, they lose the eligibility for SEIE. So. A question that you might ask is that what if they're um, uh, graduating and they're not really uh, uh, um, uh, uh, dropping uh, uh, out of school? So one thing that I want to mention regarding that is that my age variable is very precise, is uh, age in months. It's not that I don't have age, uh, I'm not comparing 21 years of age to 22 years of age. So it's age in months. If uh, my running variable was age in years, I would have uh, had that concern. But if uh, we go to the next slide and uh, we see what happens to the school enrollment of those individuals who are not getting any SSI benefits, you see that there is an a decrease in their school enrollment because uh, they are getting older, but nothing's happening to their school enrollment around this uh, 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 age 22 cutoff when they turn uh, uh, 22, and we shouldn't expect anything because they are not eligible for this SEIE. Next, please. If I want to put all these results in an econometric uh, uh, um, uh, methodology, so I'm because um, uh, they are, uh, again, of this age 22 cutoff, I'm using a regression uh, discontinuity design where I'm regressing the outcome of uh, uh, the out, uh, outcome variable of interest for an SSI recipient I in month M and in year T on the indicator uh, where uh, above age 22 when there's, this indicates when they are uh, older than 22 and on the uh, uh, running variable which is age in months, and the interaction between these two variables just to allow for differential time, uh, differential slopes around this age 22 uh, cutoff. I just want to mention that um, uh, a SIP is, uh, uh, the, the survey that I'm using is conducted in panels. So every three, four years, there is a new panel and individuals are being tracked over time. Uh, and individuals are interviewed every four months and they collect information about the month of the interview, but they also ask questions about the previous three months. So I have uh, 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 my unit of observation is uh, uh, at the individual month level. That's why here my variables are uh, at the month level. Now, if uh, I need to pass some uh, regression discontinuity test to validate my uh, um, uh, methodology. So the first step that, I mean, the idea of those tests is that I need to have similar individuals around this age 22 cutoff, because if I have different types of individuals that could lead my estimate and that could introduce a, a bias in the results that I would find. So one test that I would do is that I would check whether the density of observations around this, uh, the age 22 cutoff are the same. And I do that. I'm just not uh, going to show this, uh, the, this graph for the sake of time, uh, but the second test that I do is that I check the uh, covariates of uh, individuals, wh whether they are uh, balanced around this age uh, uh, 22 cutoff, and I see this uh, 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 balance, so whether that's about their race or uh, their gender. But what I want to mention, uh, the, the, the most uh, uh, important test that I need to pass in this particular setting is that, um, uh, I want to talk about that in the coming slide. 
So those uh, individuals, they are eligible for this SEIE only when they are getting those SSI uh, benefits, right? So some individuals might be more, so might manipulate their SSI benefits, their SSI status before age 22 to become eligible for this uh, SEIE. So first of all, in a theory, it's very hard to manipulate the timing of, of the receipt of your uh, SSI benefits because it takes time uh, uh, to become eligible for SSI benefits. Uh, you have to pass some uh, medical tests and some other income tests, so it takes time. So you cannot really uh, 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 manipulate the timing of the receipt of your uh, SSI benefits. And the other thing is that it's uh, uh, very uh, risky to come on and I mean to be on and off of uh, SSI benefits because once you're out of uh, uh, you're, uh, you disqualify of this uh, program it's very hard uh, to come back but this is in theory I still check whether they are manipulating their SSI status around this uh, age 22 cutoff and here I have a similar uh, graph where on the x-axis I have their age and on the y-axis I have the share of individuals who are getting uh, SSI benefits and I shouldn't see uh, any discontinuity or any changes in the in the receipt of SSI benefits around age 22. If I do see that, it means that they are manipulating the receipt of their SSI uh, uh, benefits, and that could create problems in my uh, 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 methodology. So next. Yeah, so as I'm showing here is that, as you can see, around age 22 cutoff, there isn't anything, there, there is nothing happening regarding their uh, SSI status. If anything, there is an increase in the share of population getting SSI benefits. So I validate this test as well. So, uh, I mean, I pass this state. So all these tests, whether it's the density uh, test or the uh, 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 having the covariates, the, uh, the covariate balance test or this test, they justify the uh, re regression discontinuity methodology. So now I can talk mo more about the uh, 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 results and the effect of this uh, of uh, the effect of the eligibility eligibility for SVIE. Next slide, please. Okay, so here I'm showing what's happening to their school enrollment once they lose the eligibility for SEIE. It's a similar graph that I showed in the descriptive uh, part of my paper, but I have uh, uh, the slopes here. So as you can see, once they are crossing this age uh, 22 cutoff, their school enrollment rate is uh, uh, sharply uh, decreasing. Next, please. Now I test this uh, 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 robustness of my, or I test this estimate, the 8.4 uh, percentage points around different specifications. So the first column is showing the same number that I showed in the previous graph. Now in the second column and the third column, I'm uh, trying to see whether there is anything happening regarding the seasonality of the school enrollment or uh, anything is being driven by changes in SSI benefits across states or anything is being driven by their uh, 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 characteristics or demographic characteristics. And as you can see, the estimates in uh, columns one to three are pretty uh, uh, constant. Uh, they are in the same direction and uh, they are all statistically significant. So losing SEIE eligibility is causing a decrease in their school enrollment by about 8.6 percentage points. And I also check whether this estimate is uh, um, uh, leading to, um, I mean, it's showing a similar results when I expand the bandwidth. So in the fourth column, I expand the bandwidth from 12 months to 24 months. The estimate is uh, showing this, uh, I mean, it has the same uh, implication, it's smaller, that, and that's because uh, I'm looking at a, 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 a bigger panel, basically. Next slide, please. So now that I talked about the effect of the eligibility for SEIE on uh, uh, school enrollment, I will talk more about their uh, labor supply outcomes. 
So again, losing SEIE eligibility is causing uh, a decrease in their employment because once they cross this age 22 cutoff, they are again subject to this 50% marginal tax rate on their earnings. So what's happening is that their employment rate is decreasing by about 8.4 percentage points, but that's mainly driven by their part-time enrollment, as you can see in the second column, and not uh, from their full-time enrollment as shown in the third column. In, next slide, please. Now here, if I want to show graphically what's happening to their uh, uh, part-time enrollment, again, there's this big discontinuity in their part-time enrollment once they cross this age 22 cutoff. They are, uh, it's uh, 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 noisier than the school enrollment because you can see that uh, they are um, uh, uh, leaving their uh, the, uh, this uh, uh, labor market right before they are turning age 22. I'm still exploring uh, what's really uh, 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 driving that, but this is what I have uh, uh, for now. In the next uh, uh, slide, I explore more whether um, um, there is any effect on the intestinal margin of labor supply. I'm not seeing any effect regarding their weekly hours or monthly earnings as uh, shown in this table, but those goes in line uh, with the literature because as the literature shows with other uh, work incentives and, basic, uh, and mostly on the, uh, the effect of earned income tax credit or the ITC benefits on labor supply of uh, single mothers, uh, that, that most of the effect is coming from the extensive margin of labor supply. So single mothers are increasing uh, their participation in the labor market, but there is nothing happening down the intensive margin of their labor supply. And this is the same uh, story that I have in this paper. Next slide, please. But the, the main outcome that the policy is targeting is this joint outcome where uh, because it's a, it's it's a simultaneous incentive for uh, for those young SI recipients to both participate in the labor market and also enrolled in school. And as you can see, this graph is showing that once they are losing the eligibility for this SEIE, they are decreasing this rate of uh, this uh, joint outcome by about 6.3 uh, percentage points. Next slide, please. Yeah, so here in the first column, I showed the same estimate that I showed in the previous uh, graph, but just to make sure that uh, um, I, the, 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 this is what the policy is exactly targeting, I look at the outcomes where only one situation is being realized. So in the first column is that when they are only working and in the third column when they are only, uh, only enrolled in school, and I'm not seeing much happening there, and this validates that indeed this uh, policy is targeting this uh, 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 joint outcome when they are both employed and also in school. Next slide, please. So I'm left with uh, one minute. What I want to mention here is that I do some uh, robustness checks. So the, the first robustness check that I do is that I do the same analysis, this RD analysis for individuals who are not getting any SSI benefits. I shouldn't see any discontinuities in their outcomes, and I don't. And the second thing that I do is that I run this uh, placebo test where I repeat the same analysis for other age cutoffs and I shouldn't see anything there. I repeat for the age 21 uh, cutoff and there is nothing uh, uh, happening there. So those are two robustness checks that validate my main uh, estimates. And to conclude, um, so what I do in this paper is that I study the effect of SEIE on education and labor supply. I do some of the uh, back of the envelope calculations and I show that a thousand dollar increase in their annual income because of SEIE is causing an increase in their school enrollment and labor supply by about three percentage points. And those results are showing that those young SSI recipients are willing to invest in their human capital skills and labor skills, but they are discouraged because of the financial constraints that they are facing and the, because of those major work disincentives that are embedded in the SSI program. Now, whether this policy, the SEIE, has any persistent effect on their human capital in the long term, for example, whether they are getting post-secondary degrees in the long term. So this is continuation of my uh, job market paper that I'm currently uh, uh, examining. But the main policy question that um, uh, uh, we can ask is that 
one of the uh, questions that you can ask, why is the age cut off at, tw at 22? Why isn't it at 25 or maybe at 27 where those young SA recipients who are coming from low income households and have disabilities have longer time to invest in their skills and get a post-secondary degree? So this is uh, uh, what I have. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. And I look forward to hearing your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sohair. All right. So I look forward to hearing more about this later. And uh, I'm going to get slides ready for the next presenter. Sorry, I think I have to go through some of your appendix slides, Sohair. So just give me a minute. <laughs> Um, but our next presentation is going to be given by Julie Tsai, who will be presenting a paper entitled Health Effects of Income Volatility Before and During the COVID-19 Pandemic. Uh, Julie, we're re ready for you. Thanks. Thanks, Natalie, and thanks to Census for hosting this conference. Thanks to everyone for coming. My ongoing research focuses on the inter intersection of economic instability, social policy, and public health. So in the next 20 minutes or so, I'm going to talk about some research about on intra-year income volatility and how it shapes working people's health. So to be clear, this is not a causal paper, um, and I'm open to any questions at the end. So as we all know, next please. As we all know, one of the most important determinant of living standards for workers and their families is earned income, right? In the past decade, increasingly, research has documented that the growing precarity of work, right? Labor market structure and job characteristic change over the last few decades and often making work more unpredictable. Job churning, inconsistent work hours, or fluctuating public benefits are all resulting in kind of some sort of income volatility or instability. And this kind of variability have increasingly surfaced in people's life, especially people with low wages. And along with this labor market churn, family structures have also seen a diverging pattern. And this frequent changing, like, you know, the frequent changes in romantic relationship or household composition may also impact the income swings. And of course, like the unwanted housing or neighborhood related churning also to common mark the life of low income peoples. So such volat uh, next please. Such volatility does not affect people equally. As we know, it's more common among less advantaged group like low skilled or low income or non white families as our previous research documented. And of course, like people with low wages as well, like it, experience more volatile hours or income in their economic life. So in 2012, like about 70% of individuals experiencing unstable incomes did so as a result of either irregular work hours or periods of unemployment. And most individuals actually reported that they would prefer a stable but lower level income to a somewhat greater degree, but unpredictable. Um, like, you know, to a somewhat like greater overall income, but uh, with poor job or our security. And this has been shown to affect poor children's outcome, like uh, adolescent school behavior and adverse adult outcomes when they were exposed to childhood income volatility and as well as material hardship. But this kind of research focus on, was primary on year over year or longer time interval in family income swings. And the outcomes they looked at were mostly on children and adolescents well-being. Although this is quite important, it only depicts part of that volatility story, right? What is missing here is the short-term ups and down of an individual's financial circumstances and its com its consequences um, on their well-being. So I would argue in this paper, like it's quite essential to, both in terms of workers' well-being and workforce productivity as a whole, given that majority of people having unstable income do so because of employment or earning churning. So next please. Here's a visual a graph to show 
how we understand this issue. So as we know, like given the financial circumstances and labor market flow are far more dynamic within a year or wait, and also wage workers comprise over half or nearly 60% of US workforce. So workers life can be better captured, I guess, on a month to month or quarter to quarter base when it comes to understanding their uh, well-being. Like Dr. Robert Moffitt just mentioned earlier, one major reason why there has not been enough attention on intra-year volatility is that month-to-month -month income data is not very widely available. So for example, like because now we are on a SIP conference, so I don't really need to sell the SIP data. And you know, it's very attractive to study this kind of within year of volatility or instability. And of course, like PSID has its own merit to study volatility, and it has been widely used to study um, like childhood income volatility and how that impact adult outcome. But now we are talking about uh, more nuanced months to months or quarter to quarter changes in workers' earnings. Next, please. So why health outcome? So we know like there has been renewed interest in understanding that in instability of the workplace and how it impact population health. And this is not surprising given the massive labor market change and declining labor union, and of course the elevated healthcare cost. And that pandemic has heightened this concern. So we know it has long been documented that low income and economic hardship are closely intertwined with health related outcome when we know relatively little about how that income variability, particularly frequent changes in earning shots linked to health outcome. So in this paper, I was trying to understand um, whether there's a relationship there and how. And we know with the rise of precarious employment over the past decade, I would say it's not uncommon for employers to be reluctant to provide health insurance or other benefits. So worker might bear the risk of re lose, lose, losing job or experiencing our variability, and both of that are likely to intertwine with intermittent insurance coverage. And of course, we may anticipate the worsened health consequences of such economic ins insecurity because you know the stress embedded through that process. So in this question, uh, in this paper, next please, I asked three questions. The first one, I was trying to understand whether intra-year volatility could be linked to a worker's self-related health status at the end of the year and how they impact their health insurance coverage within the year. And if there's any relationship there, how that association differ as to whether a worker holds a job in frontline industry. And the second question I was trying to answer is that how that relationship vary by workers, race, or ethnicity. And the last one, I was trying to understand how that house um, has impact of volatility sensitive to a worker's experience of period of unemployment. So what does this mean? Um, I guess we know earning volatility could be a result of either employment churn or in job hours changes. So here I was trying to test whether the relationship found differ by these two aspects. Next, so let's uh, look at the data. I was using the latest panel of the SEP 2018 to 2021 that covers 2017 to 2020 um, of the current for the calendar years and the sample we we study here includes working individuals age 24 or older that uh, who are observed in all 12 months within a year so it means they have 12 observations uh, within a year and i exclude those people who said they stop working or work part-time due, due to the following reasons like taking vacation taking leave attending school or because they have chronic health condition that limit their ability or taking family or personal obligations. So this result in about 86,900 worker year observations. And the outcome that I'm looking at, there are two outcomes here. The first one is health status at the measure at the end of the year, at the 12 months. So that 
you know, a worker reports their house data on a one to five scale, and this is reverse coded so that one implies pool health, the higher the better. And the second measure is a worker's insurance coverage gap. So what does this mean? A worker is asked whether they have health insurance in the current months, like, you know, including private or public insurance coverage in the current month. So this is like a time variant variable and it serves as a focal point. I could infer whether a worker experienced any status change in health insurance coverage within a year. So it's like a binary indicator at the end, whether they are experiencing a gap in insurance coverage within a year. And to capture the income volatility, I, you, I try to like capture that using multiple dimension. So the first one I did is to measure it using the standard deviation of R percent change to capture the variability, the magnitude of that volatility. And this has, this has been widely used uh, by a lot of scholars that um, uh, who studied volatility before a decade ago. And the second one is looking at the duration of that volatility, not just magnitude matters, but duration matter. So the second one, I measure it as the most longest period of adjacent months during which a worker does not experience a substantial decline in their earnings. So what do we mean substantial decline? I define it as um, decline by 20% or more. So, um, you know, a, a worker could still have experience a earning decline, but that if that doesn't reach the 20% benchmark, they are deemed as having a stable income um, across the adjacent months. So lastly is the frequency or the number of negative shock they experience within a year. And still it's 20% or more uh, as the benchmark for earning shock. So, um, and also I control a bunch of covariates in the model that we will see in a minute. This include workers' race, ethnicity, gender, age, whether they, an, an, whether they are a wage worker and whether they have any house condition that preclude, their, uh, preclude them from working at the beginning. And of, of course, the average income to needs ratio that capture their overall SES status over the year and with time and fixed effect. So next, please. Uh, okay, so quickly here, I try to run some OLS regression to understand all these questions. So the first question I was trying to test is whether volatility affect their house outcome. So the beta one here, the first model, the beta one is the coefficient of interest. And like in addition to the whole sample, I replicate diversification among people holding jobs in frontline industry in order to test whether that effect observed are more driven by their industry's status. And the second question I was trying to understand is um, whether the relationship between instability and health vary by their race or ethnicity. So I run this analysis again with the additional interaction here, um, INS plus race to understand whether there's any significant relationship there. And lastly, to test whether the results are sensitive to workers who experience either in job hour change or intermittent employment, I substitute that interaction with a binary indicator that whether a worker experience a period of unemployment within a year. So before we get to the regression result, uh, let's look at some graphs, uh, which are more descriptive in nature. So here we are looking at trends in volatility for workers industry, which on the left hand side and race or, or race or ethnicity on the right hand side. So the basic story here is that instability or was relatively steady before the pandemic, regardless of our workers' race. But in 2020, we saw a sharp increase, which is more salient for non-white workers. So for example, that volatility facing Hispanic and Black 
as well as AAPI workers increased by about 30 to 35 percent from 2017 to 2020, while white workers saw nearly like 20 percent increase during the same period. Um, next, please. So the second graph here report reports a downward trend in workers self-rated health status. So recall the higher, the better. So now we see black workers, so a lower level of health score throughout that followed by Hispanic peers. And so for example, like black workers level of health status is about like three to 6% lower than their counterparts from other racial group across the whole period. And lastly, uh, the next graph shows us the fraction of people who were experienced intermittent insurance coverage. Sorry, uh, could you advance to the next one? Yeah, so this is the fraction of people who experience intermittent insurance coverage. So it's interesting to observe that the trend between different groups diverged a little bit in 2019 with AAPI and white workers seeing declining trend, but the proportion of Hispanic and Black facing a little bit, um, facing the coverage gap surged during that same year. But this is our all descriptive in nature, and I would say it's a bit puzzling given, given the business disruption in the 2020 during the pandemic year, we see actually a decline for the percentage of people who experience intermittent insurance coverage. I'm happy to um, hear what other people think about that in a minute. So far, all those results have been seen, you know, uh, un unadjusted. So we might, there might be other demographic factor or state of residence that could impact the disparity we see from this graph. So I'm going to proceed to estimate some regression and see what a uh, final relationship we might find. So the first hypothesis here is that I anticipate a volatility could be negatively associated with their house re, uh, their house outcome at the end of the year and as well as the coverage gap during the year. And that association might differ by their industry status. Next, please. Um, okay, so I want, in the interest of time, I won't get into the, the detail of the coefficient, but the main takeaway from this is I run three setup model uh, from different, uh, to uh, using different key predictor as I conceptualize uh, the income volatility to understand how they impact the two, uh, each of the two outcomes. So the main takeaway here is that when volatility is greater in magnitude or more frequent, is they are associated with adverse health score and they are all significant. And they are also related to greater likelihood of having intermittent health insurance coverage. Uh, so here, I just want to point out of the second panel, panel B, as we see worker who experience one additional adjacent month or consecutive months with stable earning had a significant increase in their house in their house score at the end of the year and this is controlled for their baseline um, house status so i would argue um, you know stability matter a lot for people's or workers house next please so the second question I was trying to test was whether the volatility relationship vary by workers' race or ethnicity. And the next table that we are looking at shows that actually the volatility, so the Hispanic class volatility coefficient is significant. It is significant, so that implies that when facing greater volatility, Hispanic worker have a significant lower self-related house score, and this is significant. And also, they are having higher probability of having they are having higher probability to experience insurance coverage gap. And for the intermittent insurance coverage gap, we also see black people were having a higher likelihood 
to have to event when facing volatility, greater vol volatility. And lastly, we, next please, lastly, I try to understand whether that relationship vary by their in-job hour change or intermittent employment status, but I do not find any evidence on that. None of the interaction coefficients are significant. So to sum up, Overall, we see like no matter relationship, regardless relation, um, regardless the direction change, income volatility is related to adverse health score for workers and greater likelihood to have intermittent insurance coverage because you know sometimes the up and down months to months could influence their eligibility for health insurance, or if they are losing a job, they might lose health care as well. And workers who experience additional adjacent months with stable earnings have a significant improved health score at the end of the year and were less likely to experience that intermittent insurance coverage. And most of this effect were shown to be pronounced or salient among frontline workers. When facing greater volatility, Hispanic workers might um, have higher chance to experience this kind of adverse health impact, uh, adverse health effect or events. And lastly, I do not find any evidence to show that there would be a different, um, there will be a different effect from in-job hour change or intermittent employment as it comes to workers' health outcome. So that means income volatility is generally uh, bad for people's health. It doesn't matter whether you are experiencing workplace instability or labor market flows. And lastly, this has some limitations that we should keep in mind when understand this result. So next, please. So the first one I want to point out is that because the sample includes workers who were observed in all 12 months, but you know, there's a lot of plyo study that documented people who were less advantaged might be more likely to drop out of the survey. So I would say this sample might be a group of relatively advantaged workers. Um, so this could be one of the limitations that we should keep in mind. And the second one is that I do not have any information about workers' health status prior to the year, so it will be good to control for that to see what um, what would happen or whether the result was still whole uh, once we control their prior year's health status when we predict um, their health status at the end of the year. So I will stop there and happy to take any questions. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Julie. All right, so we have now heard uh, two very interesting presentations. And at this point, we're going to move to the for formal discussion piece of, of today's session, uh, which will be followed by an open Q&A. But before we get there, uh, I would like to welcome our first discussant, Adam B., who will discuss the first paper. Uh, and just bear with me a moment as I try to switch over to a different screen share for uh, the slide that Adam has prepared. Thanks, Natalie. Um, I, I just have uh, a few comments um, and I don't necessarily need the slide if it, if it uh, I sent it in pretty late. So, hey, there we go. That's great. Okay. So, yeah, I would say, um, I would say this is a great paper. Um, I don't need to tell you, uh, you all just saw it. Um, I think it's very simple and easy to understand, uh, an extremely credible story and really well polished. Um, I think it's worth going and uh, finding this paper. It's easy to find and reading it, and you'll be glad that you did. Um, I think it's ready to go out the door to a journal uh, today. You can send this to JPAM, and it's got a pretty good shot at uh, <laughs> being accepted. So everything I have to say is really marginal uh, or for extensions for like a spinoff paper. Um, and I would say, I remember, I'm reminded of my uh, old advisor's uh, advice, uh, Bill Evans, who's a saint, um, and he said that you could tell a paper is good, uh, it, that it's a product of how credible it is uh, multiplied by how interesting it is. 
And uh, you can tell how credible it is by the research design and how interesting it is, is defined by whether or not you wish you had thought of this first. And this is <laughs> falls into that category. This is a pretty uh, interesting program and, uh, and uh, really well done paper. Um, I would say that, uh, so figure four tells the whole story. You, you see like a really uh, quick uh, drop off in, uh, in large effects, um, almost shockingly large effects. So like a third of people, uh, these SSI recipients who are in school, stop going to school. A quarter of those that are employed stop being employed. Uh, really massive effects. Um, it is kind of striking how low the annual limits are relative to the monthly. So basically uh, that these limits, uh, are about on for the annual are about four as equal to about four months of uh, the the monthly limits. But it looks like in earlier years that you can uh, kind of save up those exemptions and apply them to earnings uh, earned across the years. But as far as I could tell, uh, the the difference is at that cutoff that you have to be earning the earnings in the year in the months before you turn twenty two. So. Um, or so it's uh, so the, the the cutoff is really clean. I did kind of like wish for a little bit more of that um, nitty gritty detail, of like how often do these uh, recipients have to validate their monthly earnings and how do they do this? Um, but these are the sorts of like institutional details that a referee would like request and then insist be put into a web appendix. And I don't think it would like prevent them from. Uh, you know, I don't think anyone would have, like reject it. They would just say like, I want to revise and resubmit. And then this would be like a really minor revision. Um, uh, I would say, uh, so these are like really small numbers on this margin, um, but they are like the poorest of the poor. And as, as you showed, they're growing uh, quickly. So it's a potential, uh, certainly a lot, gets a lot of like policy interest. Um, also, you see these mar uh, treatment effects right at that margin, but uh, they're plausibly generalizable. They apply for people like between that in that eight, 18 to 22 range. Um, and it, it is a little hard to tell like what um, the counterfactuals look like. So if you, we were to expand it to say 25, as you suggested, it could be that people are timing their um, classes to try to squeeze everything in and that maybe they would like uh, continuing to go to school, but maybe they, they, they would spread out their classwork more so such that the overall uh, capital invest, human gas, capital investment might not, may or may not vary uh, much um, when you move that cutoff down. But it does look super clear that uh, people are really well um, uh, uh, affected by this. Um, I would also say that using, it's kind of interesting, most papers that you see with the use of SIP really lean on the panel nature of this. And this doesn't really necessarily uh, of, of the SIP, but this really exploits the fact that the month of birth is available in the SIP. Uh, if I were to tell you that uh, this group of uh, 20, like people turning 21 to 22 are, people are much less likely to go to school when they're 22, you say, not a big deal. But if I showed you that they're less likely to go to school the month after they turn 22, then you'd be like, wait a second, something is strange going on there. So I think that having that uh, month of birth is really, uh, the key uh, aspect of the, the data um, requirements. Um, I would also say this is perhaps a lower bound on the effects. Uh, we, we have these papers here at Census that uh, document this program confusion. A lot of people will get these old age and survivor disability benefits from Social Security, think that that is SSI. Um, and given that SSI is such a small program, then the people identified as SSI in the SIP are, uh, in fact, so that's more of a problem for old people, for sure. But there's also like these survivor and disability benefits uh, that can apply to people who are younger, um, though often they cut off at 18. So it's hard to say how much that matters here, but if anything, it would only support it because you're sort of scrambling the treatment and control uh, groups a little bit at that. I, I would say that I think that the, um, the analyses that lean on the difference in difference um, method more than the event studies, so that do bring in that that non uh, SSI population. I think you do credibly identify uh, parallel trends. Um, so, so you said like the you, 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 in the and in the paper you kind of like uh, put those to the side, but I think that that is uh, actually a little bit more credible when you see that it's so smooth across that cutoff for the non SSI population. Um, you could potentially. Uh, reduce the non-SSI population to be like, um, maybe like lower income or from lower income areas or something. But 
uh, or households, but uh, I don't. I thought it was pretty good as is. One concern I might have had would be around like seasonality of birth. That there's this um, really well documented feature that winter babies have like lower uh, uh, socioeconomic outcomes. Uh, so you want to kind of make sure that samples are balanced across birth months. Um, so it's possible, <laughs> you know, that the school year ends in the summer, people can sort of take summer classes. And for this program, you, as long as you intend to go back, you still qualify for those months. Um, so it doesn't matter too much, but you would kind of think that maybe that there's some uh, potential um, uh, uh, problems around that seasonality of birth. Uh, but uh, you could potentially use the CPS and the ACS to investigate these. So uh, <laughs> internally, I'm a little spoiled uh, at census, like we have access to, the, and you can request access to the uh, dates of birth um, and months of birth uh, in a FSRDC project, but they do have a uh, quarter of birth. And I do think that using just year of birth was fine in the uh, difference in difference um, specification. And uh, in any case, I think that, uh, so this would be a spinoff paper, but it would massively expand the, the sample. Um, it looked like there was only about 181 uh, SSI recipients within these um, two year cutoffs, two year um, panel like window. So um, it would be nice. You did use the um, survey um, weights, which is super important in the SIP given the oversampling of the poor. Uh, I didn't see like they, explicitly said they use the replicate weights. I don't think it matters too much, but it would be nice. Maybe a uh, referee might ask for like clustering by at the person level to control for the autocorrelation within person. Each of these person month um, observations is not necessarily independent from the other person months within the person. Um, so, uh, but not super duper important. I think it's a pretty clear and massive uh, effect. Um, this last thing, I that there's very few papers at all about this program, kind of shockingly, given how important it seems to be. Uh, there's this one, the only thing I could find <laughs> was this one paper from 2010 uh, written by uh, Social Security Administration uh, economists and published in the Social Security Bulletin. And it has like some nice aggregate stats. It suggests that um, they seem to think that, uh, that yeah, I, this SEIE eligibility is uh, in the like 20, 2004 to 2005 period, so not quite the same, but that they thought that it was lost by leaving school at age 22. But I think your work pretty clearly shows that people are um, anticipating potentially that they're going to lose this eligibility and then uh, finishing up their schoolwork potentially, or um, so that these uh, outcomes are perhaps co determined. Um, so uh, that's. Uh, these are maybe some <laughs> like uh, things to add in or not, uh, but I think this is a great paper and uh, I appreciated uh, the opportunity to read it. Uh, thanks. Thank you so much, Adam. Thank you. I really appreciate this. Yes, thank you, Adam. All right, so I'm gonna I'll I'll give everyone um, I'll give Shohara a moment to respond in a bit. First, um, I think it would be good to hear from our second discussant, and then I'll turn it to. The two presenters in case they have anything that they wanted to respond to from the discussants. So, um, bear with me as as I switch over the slide deck again, but Larissa Makita will be uh, presenting remarks. Right, Larissa, um, if you're able to see my screen, then I can see the screen. Yeah, and I'll try and I'll try and prompt you to change slides, but I may not. So you may just have to read my mind. Um, OK, so first of all, I really appreciated the opportunity to read and discuss um, Julie Kai's promising and ambitious paper, uh, Health Effects of Income Volatility Before and During the COVID-19 Pandemic. Um, so just to, just in sum, Julie Julie really laid this out very well, but to remind everyone, um, she used the 2018 to 2021 SIP, which references years 2017 to 2020, to examine associations between summary measures of month-to-month -month earnings volatility, so kind of intra-year volatility, um, with both self-reported health and health insurance status. I'm thrilled by this paper for a whole bunch of reasons. One, she's examining intra-year volatility, and that's exactly the kind of sort of short-term volatility and transition 
that SIP was originally designed to capture, but which, as she points out, or as she pointed out, hasn't often has often been examined, maybe, um, at least not recently. Her discussion this afternoon laid the motivation for the paper uh, in terms of precarious work and in terms of the consequences of family and economic stability on sort of other outcomes. But I think this paper, what another thing that excites me about it is that it also speaks to kind of this literature on working conditions and health outcomes more generally, including kind of the seminal works by Marmot and Williamson, but uh, more recent work by the sociologists Schneider and Harknett in um, with their shift project work. And so I'm really looking forward to see seeing how this project develops and how this paper comes along. Um, I did have several thoughts and reactions as I read, and I'm going to start. I'll try and start with some general comments um, and move to more specific comments or concerns. I do have one nitpicky comment about the title, and that's that it really doesn't capture what the paper does. Um, it's really a paper about earnings volatility and not income volatility. She makes that really clear in the text of the paper, but the title is still income volatility. Um, it also She's not really, I don't think she's really showing causal effects, but rather association. So, um, you know, I'm a sociologist, but uh, I would be a little more cautious about avoiding causal language. Um, okay, COVID, the, the period. So the data presented were collected before and during the COVID-19 pandemic, but there wasn't really a discussion of how the pandemic and the effects of the pandemic on data collection um, and potential non-response might impact the results. I, I think it's been particularly challenging to make sense of trends over the course of the pandemic using survey data, and I really commend her on her efforts to do this. Um, and especially sort of during 2020 and even 2021, um, given changes to survey data collection. So, you know, while the results presented were kind of preliminary, I think, I think in the next iteration, it'll be important to grapple with how the trends observed might have been impacted, not just by COVID itself, but also how the data or the results might have been impacted by, you know, the data collection changes uh, um, that COVID the necessitated. Um, it also begs the question, and I'm really curious, I think it's an interesting question of whether and how this association between earnings volatility and health in the period that, that Julie examines, uh, which included both economic shocks, right, you know, there's kind of the pandemic recession, but also this big health shock uh, differs from other periods. And so that might be something worth exploring as well. You know, not in this paper, I'll come to that in a minute, but um, just to see do these, are the, how, how are, are these, some of these associations different across time. Um, the other thing, and I, I know she brought up the puzzle of 2019 in some of her graphs, and I was pretty struck by that too. So I would really encourage kind of look, taking a look at the technical documentation of the SIP on the data for each year. Uh, 2019 also faced challenges of collection. Um, you know, there have some other ideas too for what might be going on, but that seems like uh, um, enough of a blip that uh, I would look a little bit, I would, I would dig into the data a little more. Um, when I went through the, the paper and I was reading through the research questions, I couldn't help but wonder, and I do this a lot, uh, but it really struck me with uh, Julie's ambitious paper, is, is this one paper or is it more than one? And so with this paper, I think the answer is most definitely the latter. Um, she sets out these four research questions, um, impact of any volatility, differences for frontline workers, differences by race and ethnicity, and differences by kind of this job employment shock as a source of volatility. But I think there's so much more to unpack with each of those that I think it could easily, easily be three full length, interesting papers. Um, I really liked that she looked at a bunch of different dimensions of volatility, uh, um, including, you know, experience of any earnings volatility, the duration of the earnings volatility, and the source of earnings volatility, uh, which she kind of looked at by sort of this earnings shock versus other sources. But I found myself like really wanting more and wishing that there was more here on, um, you know, I don't know if the data doesn't allow it or on source of the volatility, right? Because if you think about earnings volatility over the course of a year, it might come from several different sources, which she acknowledges. One is job loss. One is kind of change in work hours despite stable employment, right? You could, you could have very kind of volatile work hours. 
um, and that would lead to that would lead to earnings volatility. Um, gig work or seasonal work, seasonal work you might expect some volatility, and so your your outcomes might differ if it's expected versus unexpected. And I think that's what she was trying to get at with this sort of unemployment shock. But I'm really kind of interested in those workers that, you know, as a matter of course of of their employment, their hours and earnings vary, right? It's not just they lose their job, but their their hours and earnings vary like week to week. Um, okay, so that was that was one thing. The other thing is I've really been kind of thinking about the the health insurance coverage and transitions in coverage over the past few years. Um, health insurance. It's a measure of access to care and well-being and not a, not really a measure of health itself. It's important to, to look at, yes, but I think that in part because it's in, it's tied to employment for many, but not for all workers, it feels a little circular to look at earnings volatility and then this loss of coverage. Um, and I also wasn't really clear how um, individuals who had no coverage for the whole period were treated versus those who were covered the entire year. So I, I couldn't tell whether she's only kind of measuring this gap, this loss or gaining coverage, and then which direction, right? I think it's also important to kind of consider that there are transitions between coverage types that might not show up as a loss of coverage, um, but, but may be analytically important in and of themselves, losing private coverage for public or, you know, going in the other direction as well. And finally, you know, health insurance coverage isn't just related to your own employment and your own earnings, but it may, you may have coverage through another family member. And so I'm not sure whether, whether or how this was considered in the analysis. Um, so I think I would really focus a paper on the health outcome and then examine health insurance coverage separately. Um, Cause there, I think that there are kind of a bunch of little thorny, thorny measurement issues that, uh, might need to be addressed. Um, I had a couple more specific question, uh, comments about measurement and controls. Um, one is, you know, the 20% cutoff for volatility made sense. And yet for me, a 20% decline in monthly income might be experienced differently but at different ends of the income distribution. So maybe incorporate some robustness checks that look at different cutoffs. I don't know whether, whether you've tried that or um, what you would think about that. Um, frontline workers, I think, is is tricky, right? Because um, one, I think you could write a separate paper on frontline workers, but I don't. I, I'm really sort of not clear on the definition of a frontline worker, and I know you cite uh, a paper by Hardy, whatever, but I'm not. I'm also not sure that frontline is being conflated here with essential workers. Um, I'd look to analysts at Census uh, Industry and Occupation Branch or uh, the BLS to try and get a little more consensus. I also think, and I, this is, I think this is a disciplinary um, thing, uh, whether you're talking about, I mean, you seem to be talking about industry and I'm wondering whether occupation matters more here. Right. So industries are sectors, occupations are jobs, and these are very different. So I think about the even just like thinking about the health and health related services industry, your work life is going to look very different if you're a hospital administrator or if you're a home health care aide. And so there it's like, is it the is it the industry or is it the job? Um, so I really um, I would really encourage you to kind of think think about job as well as industry. Uh, you restrict the sample to age 24 and older. Often we look at educational attainment that's measured at 25 and older. Um, and I, I just wasn't sure why 24 was chosen. You know, on the one hand, yes, folks may be finished college by then. But um, I, other than that, I wasn't sure why 24 versus 25. Um, controls, is there a, there are a couple things that I felt were omitted actually from the controls, and maybe they were included and just not mentioned, first and foremost, marital status. Um, I think this, I think you absolutely need to control for marital status in, in your model. Uh, it's associated with health, both health outcomes and health insurance coverage. Um, and uh, you might also consider controlling for other sources of income, but I, I, I'm not, you know, wedded to that. Or I would also really, really be interested, I mean, you look at race, but I'd really be interested in seeing interactions by race and gender. Um, 
as well as I had already kind of mentioned uh, more exploration of differences by the source of volatility. But I think you might you might unpack some interesting findings by by looking at it through a lens of race and gender. Um, you say that you couldn't get health status in the prior year, but I think I thought that it's collected each year in SIP, um, self-reported health. So I would just take a look at that. Another thing that, you know, when we work with SIP sometimes, or uh, uh, I know that some of the HDSB analysts have thought about this quite a bit is, um, I don't know whether you looked at all at, uh, by who was reporting, right? Um, self versus a proxy report, right? Because if you're asking about health status, uh, does, it, does someone reporting their own health look different from somebody else reporting that person's health. So you might want to just look at that as a sensitivity analysis down the road. Other than that, I think this is a great paper with a lot of promise. I'm really excited about it. Um, and I hope that my comments were helpful. Thank you. Thanks so much, Larissa. All right. So we have um, reached this, the segment of this session where we can start opening uh, the the Q and A to the audience. Um, it is two twenty. I know we end at two forty five. So before I start gathering questions, I might. Uh, I'm thinking that I'll give the the two speakers five minutes to uh, respond in any way that they might want to to the discussants. So, um, Shohair, do you want to go first? Is there anything that you wanted to say in response to those comments? And again, please try to keep anything to uh, five minutes so we can move to open Q and A. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank, I just want to thank Adam for uh, all the comments. I really appreciate it. Uh, I'm definitely uh, trying to work on the seasonality of uh, the um, uh, birth months, so. I'll definitely incorporate that uh, uh, in my paper. And then the second thing that I want to mention, whether I uh, I can replicate this with the CPS or the ACS with the restricted uh, 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 version uh, of those uh, um, uh, surveys, uh, I, I'll make sure to get in touch with you uh, uh, to know more about the procedure to get access to those surveys, and it would be great uh, to repeat the analysis just to have um, uh, to validate the results uh, with those. Yeah, thank 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 you so much for everything. Yeah. Yeah, no problem. Um, yeah, the, the ACS has quarter of birth and in, in yeah. the public use files, and CPS has year of birth. So it would require like using the public use would still be a would still work with the difference in difference design, but um, okay. yeah, it would okay. definitely be much better with a, like an RDC uh, proposal. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, Emily. Thank you. Great. All right. So, Julie, uh, would you like to take about five minutes to respond to any of the comments you received from Larissa? Oh, yeah, uh, for sure. And thank you, Larissa, for this wonderful comment. And they are all well taken. I was so busy checking notes and I, yeah, I mean, there's a lot to respond, but I guess the, yeah, I would need to delve deeper into the coverage outcome. Like you said, perhaps that would uh, lead to another paper uh, that separately look at health insurance. Yeah, I agree. I mean, there could be a lot of going on or they might have the coverage to other family members, not uh, through them, not through their employer directly. So I guess one thing I might do, just try to control for whether there's other family member change job, uh, like within a year. I, I mean, that's just like one thing that popped in my mind at this moment, but, but yeah, definitely I would need to think more about that insurance coverage um, and the duration within a year. Um, and another thing, yeah, I mean, a lot of sensitivity check that I need to do. Um, like you said, the cut off of uh, of the substantial earning decline. Uh, perhaps I could try like thirty percent because I thought like twenty is like a benchmark people usually did. But yeah, uh, yeah I, I would have to do maybe like thirty or thirty three percent as well to test that. And yeah, the control. True. I mean. Yeah, I, I sorry. I mean, I didn't. Yeah, I forgot about marital status. Of course, I, I think yeah. it's such an important um, 
predictor or covariate there. And also the the occupation. I thought maybe like industry or occupation, that debate would perhaps that would lead to another paper. I was just um, thinking, I told myself, maybe I need more motivation to think more about why I want to focus on industry, like frontline industry. And, but I know um, there are the people who kept us safe and, you know, keep the economy running uh, at the beginning of the pandemic. So that's what, like one of the motivation I thought I would just try to focus on those essential workers. But I know there's a lot of different definitions, how yes. we find, and yes, Thank you so much for all those. I was busy. In the, in the, I, I'm sorry to interrupt you. In the chat, uh, Linda Laughlin, the branch chief of our industry and occupation branch, just put in a helpful link, some background on some ways to define frontline versus essential, et cetera. So if you take a look at the chat and copy the link, um, you'll have that. And I'm happy. I know that I threw a lot at you all at once, uh, and I'm happy to send you uh, my comments in writing. All right. Thank you so much, Larissa. Great. All right. So um, I'm excited to continue the conversation, but with a larger group of people as well. So at this time, we will open the discussion to the audience as well for Q&A. So if you have a question that you would like to either uh, ask verbally, uh, you can click the raise hand function in WebEx, and I'll just need to call on you so that you will be unmuted. Alternatively, you can pop a question into the chat and I'm trying to monitor it so that I can read anything that shows up. Um, yeah, feel free to ask questions. So in this in the chat, I haven't seen anything new pop up. I know there was a discussion earlier about looking at long run employment uh, slash income outcomes. I didn't know if either the person who had asked the question, Richard, if you wanted to elaborate at all, or if uh, Shoher, you wanted to uh, add anything to your response to that question. Uh, Richard and I, we already communicated, but I, if uh, um, there, there are more, more questions, I'm happy to answer those. Thank you. All right, so I assume that if I'm not hearing anything from Richard, then his question has been fully addressed. Great. All right, so I believe this session ends at 2.45 officially, um, but, you know, if we don't, have a bunch of additional questions, of course, I will let uh, folks leave early. So please, uh, if you have questions, raise your hand. Okay, I do think that I see a couple of raised hands right now. Um, and please do bear with me because I am figuring out this technology today as well. So I think actually Richard does have his hand raised. So um, if someone could unmute Richard, then we can uh, hear if he had some additional questions. So is Anthony, are you going to be unmuting folks who have questions or is that something that I am able to do on my end? I apologize, folks. Uh, I was under the impression that the technical team uh, would be unmuting folks. 
Uh, this is my first time chairing a session in WebEx, so I am not familiar with whether I am able to do the unmuting. So if folks have their hands raised, um, let's see if I can give it another shot. Is, is it possible to unmute Andrew Socho? I know that he also had his hand raised. If not, I might ask people to pop their questions into the chat. And again, apologies for uh, the technical um, challenges here. Okay, thank you. I'm not sure. Juan, can you hear me? Yes, I yes, can hear. Yes, Andrew. Yep. Uh, it was just in regards to the paper on the SSI. I'm forgetting her name. Uh, great research. Uh, I had a father who went on disability SSI benefits when I was young. And regarding that 19 to 22 uh, cohort, whether or not we know, obviously, probably HIPAA issues, but I've of late seen a lot of people who go on SSI disability benefits, uh, you know, related to health outcomes, whether it's anxiety or depression or, um, you know, physical disability, not just physical disabilities, um, mental health issues. And now with COVID, you've got long run COVID issues and it'll probably grow. Of course, you know, she mentioned um, attain educational attainment. We know you can't be independent until you're 24 for FAFSA. Um, and whether or not just she knows that 90 to 22 cohort, why um, they are on just receiving those benefits. I don't even know if SSI has that kind of anonymized data to scrub the PII and just say, like, they are receiving these benefits, you know, X amount for whatever reason. Great research. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, so, what I'm trying to do right now is that to identify the the, the disability type that they have. I'm trying uh, because I so the current research that I have. I've been working with the SIP core uh, uh, um, uh, survey, but what I'm trying to do is that I'm trying to bring in the topical modules of uh, SIP to get access to their uh, disability type. Uh, one thing about this topical mo module is that I get to see their disability type uh, only in one uh, period in time. So it's like in, in a given month, so I cannot track it over time. Of course, that's that's not uh, a, a major issue because if they have a major disability, it, 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 it might be long lasting. So, yeah, uh, I really appreciate your question. So I'm trying to work on that to uh, match that topical modules with the core modules to get access to uh, uh, their disability types and to talk more about uh, 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 those. But what I can say is that um, there is very little work on um, describing the disability types of those young individuals, those uh, especially the ones who are between ages of 19 and 22. Uh, there are some studies done by the um, um, uh, Mathematica Center, uh, and uh, they show that, I mean, they are interviewing those young SSI recipients and also older ones. And what they're showing is that the younger ones, as you mentioned, uh, it's not the case that they all of them have physical disabilities. It's many of them have uh, mental disabilities uh, that so the the idea of that report is that the, the main conclusion is that 73% of those young SSI recipients they consider employment as a near future goal and they say that they are able to do physical activities outside of the house and they feel much healthier than older compared to um uh, older or a bit uh, 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 older uh, SSI uh, recipients uh so yeah, so definitely I need to uh, uh, work more into uh, 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 dig more into that uh, part of the uh, SIP data set and to know more about their disability types. Yeah, thank you so much. Great, thank you.